Hello, and welcome to episode 16 of the How to Make Any Game Mechanics series. If you're new around here, in each and every episode, we randomly choose a viewer's game mechanic suggestion, and I just try and create it in real time. As a disclaimer, as this is my first crack at making the mechanic, it may not be the greatest method to create it, so take everything you see here with a grain of salt. With that being said, if you're following along and run into any hiccups along the way, there's a link to the GitHub for this project in the description box below, which contains each and every episode. So after giving the wheel spin, today's suggestion comes from Krishna Rai, who suggested, I would love to see a bat physic. Even when you change the bat position, it still swings when clicking the button. I just started learning Unity and making the bat swing with pivot point, but as soon as I change the bat position, it stops working and starts to teleport. I absolutely love it when you guys include so much detail. This seems like a pretty niche topic, but your comment actually has quite a few likes, so it's possible that more of you guys might be running into the same problem. So with that being said, let's tackle this issue and head on over to Unity. I'm in the Unity game engine, and I created an episode 16 folder and an episode 16 scene. We are inside that blank scene now. So as already stated, this seems to be a very specific problem. Although, since you did state bat physics, we might as well go ahead and create something cool while we're here, and just use it as a learning experience. In my head, I'm just kind of thinking of some sort of a time-based batting mechanic, but I still kind of want to be able to control the direction of the swing. So to get started today, let's go ahead and let's create a ground. I'm just going to create a 2D object, sprite, and it's going to be a square, and we can just rename it to ground. I'm then going to reset the transform, and then add a box collider 2D. We can then go ahead and scale our ground and move it to the bottom of our scene. So something like that should be fine. While we're here, we might as well go ahead and change our background color. As you know, I absolutely hate this disgusting blue color. So let's click on our main camera, navigate to background type, change it to solid color, and let's give it a nice soft gray. This should do just fine for our purposes, and let's move on to importing some sprites. I've gone ahead and created a few baseball sprites, and I'm just going to open it up on my second monitor, and I'm just going to drag it into the project folder. Let's go ahead and change our import settings. So the sprite mode is going to be multiple, pixels per unit is going to be 16, filter mode point no filter, and no compression. I'm then going to open up the sprite editor, and you can see all of these sprites I made. I made a character, a baseball bat, a baseball. This is going to be for our UI, as well as this little tiny indicator. We can go ahead and we can slice this to be 32 by 32, which is just the resolution I created these sprites in. So with those all sliced up, I'm going to hit apply, and our sprites are now successfully imported. Now we can go ahead and create our player. I like to just create a blank object, so just create an empty, let's call it player. Let's make sure we reset that transform. And I'm just going to open up my sprites and drag the player sprite to be a child of our player object. Moving on, let's right click on our player, main parent object, and create another empty object. And this is going to be for our bat. We can then feel free to drag the bat sprite to be a child of the bat object. I want my bat to be in front of the player, so I'm going to change the sorting layer to be 1. I'm then just going to move this bat parent object over to the side of the player, and maybe even just up a little bit. We can then zoom in, and what I'm going to want to do is select my sprite sheet, and just move it so that the handle of the bat is in the middle of the parent object. So if I move it up just like so, and then click on the parent object, you can see the bat is now pivoted to the parent right from the handle. We can then just move that back down into place, so just something like this for now. I'm then just going to select my player, zoom out, and just put it at the bottom of our scene. So something like that should just be fine. We can then go ahead and let's just start on our baseball. I'm just going to drag the baseball sprite right into the scene, and we can just rename this to baseball. And let's go ahead and give it a Circle Collider 2D. Let's go ahead and scale that to be a better match for our baseball. And let's give it a Rigid Body 2D. 
In the previous episode, we made a bit of a bouncy physics material for our grenade. So I'm going to select the physics material of our Circle Collider 2D and just select that grenade physics material. This baseball should now bounce a little bit when it hits the ground. So let's just zoom out, let's go ahead and let's hit play, and let's just make sure that everything is working as intended so far. So I hit play, our baseball hits the ground, bounces a little bit, which is a pretty nice effect, and our player does absolutely nothing as expected. So let's uncheck play. And we're actually done with the baseball for now. What we're going to want to do though, is just make sure we create a prefab. So let's drag our baseball into the projects folder. We can then go ahead and just delete it from our scene as we're going to be spawning these later. The very next thing we're going to want to do is navigate to our episode 13 crosshair. And I'm just going to drag the crosshair into the scene. And I'm going to go ahead and drag the crosshair script onto the crosshair. If you remember in this episode, all this is going to do is just allow our crosshair to move around with our mouse inside the scene. Let's then navigate back to our episode 16 folder and let's hit play and just make sure that that's working as intended as well. Okay, perfect. Our crosshair is following the cursor just as expected. The very first thing on our to-do list is to make the player's bat follow along with the cursor. I'm then going to want to be able to click the left mouse button and have the bat swing. When the bat swings, we're also going to want to be spawning our baseball. And we're going to be using some sort of a UI to determine what the force of that baseball is going to be. But let's take things one step at a time and just make sure that the player's bat follows along with the cursor. What I'm going to do is go into our project folder right click and create a new C sharp script. And I'm just going to call this picture. After your script is created, let's go ahead and click on our player and just drag the script on top. So now our player has a picture script. We can then go ahead and open this picture script up in VS code. I am inside VS Code and let's start setting up the stage for our bat to face the cursor. The very first thing we're going to want to do is start creating some variables. So let's start and let's make a crosshair variable. So let's make a serialized field, private, transform, crosshair. We can then go ahead and since we know we're going to need the bat, make a transform for that as well. So another serialized field private transform bat. We're probably going to want to track the direction from the bat to the crosshair. So let's make a private variable for that. So let's make a private and let's make a vector three bat dir. And this is just going to be the direction the bat is facing towards the cursor. So with our variables now created, let's scoot on over to update and get our bat following along with our cursor. So bat dir is going to be equal to crosshair dot position minus bat dot position. Let's make our bat face towards the crosshair. So bat dot transform dot right is going to be equal to the bat dir. I'm just going to save this up and head back into Unity to show you what these two lines of code are going to be doing. So back in Unity, I'm just going to click on the player and we have our picture script. I'm going to drag the crosshair into the crosshair slot and the bat into the bat slot. We can now hit play. And as you can see, the bat is actually facing towards the crosshair. This is exactly what we want. I think the next thing we should tackle is when we click, it should flip the bat and face away from the crosshair. Currently, the bat could also just be displaced maybe about another 20 degrees as to just better visually match a pitching position. So with those changes in mind, let's exit out of play mode and head back into VS Code. I am inside VS Code and let's start setting up those variables for our offsets. Let's go ahead and make a, another serialized field so we can edit it in the inspector. So serialized field. Let's make a private float bat pitch rotation offset. And we can just make this equal to, I don't know, let's call it 20 degrees for now. We can then make yet another serialized field and let's make a private float bat swung rotation offset. And we can just default this to 90. While we're here, we might as well go ahead and make a private vool to tell if we have swung the bat or not. So let's make a private vool and let's just call it swung. 
Never getting into update, let's go ahead and let's do the logic to determine what has happened if we have swung the bat or not. So let's make a temporary variable. So let's make a vector three and we can just call it bat rot. And it's gonna be equal to the bats transform dot rotation dot Euler angles. We can then check if we have swung or not. So if swung is equal to false, then we know that we are in the resting pitching position. So the bat dot rotation is going to be equal to quaternion dot Euler bat rot dot X bat rot dot Y bat rot dot Z. What we're going to want to do is we're going to want to add our pitch rotation. So let's make a plus bat pitch rot offset. So all this is going to do is make our bat face our crosshair and this just rotated an additional 20 degrees, which is what we have set up here in our variable declaration. We can then do the exact same thing for when we have swung the bat. So if we have swung, then the bat's rotation is going to be equal to quaternion dot Euler and inside bat rot dot X, bat rot dot Y, bat rot dot z and then we're going to minus the bat swung rot offset before we do anything else let's scroll down to the bottom of our update function and let's just do a check for input so if input get mouse button down zero so if we left click then swung is equal to not swung so if it's true, it'll go to false, and if it's false, it will go to true. We can then save this up, and let's head back into Unity. I am back in Unity and looking at our picture script, and we have a bat pitch raw offset and a bat swung raw offset, and they're already set to 20 and 90. We can then go ahead and we can hit play, and you can see the bat has a 20 degree rotation away from the cursor. And if I hit the left mouse button, you can see the bat is now somewhat facing the crosshair. It's just offset by 90 degrees. And this is going to be the basis of our pitching mechanic. Well, at least the visuals anyways. If I continue to just click the left mouse button, you're going to notice that this just looks a little bit off. It looks like he is somehow hitting it and just rotating the bat from this pivot point. To make this look more like a swing, when we actually click the left mouse button, we should just move the bat over just a little bit. That way it looks like it has traveled across his body. So let's exit out of play and let's do that now. To make the bat move from the pitching position to the swung position, we're going to be needing to store the initial position that the bat is in when you are pitching and the position where we want it to be after we have swung. The main point of the comment that Kershana made, when they attempted this on their own and then moved the player, the bat would actually teleport. And this is due to Kershana probably not using local position. What we're actually going to be doing is saying keep the bat this distance away from the player parent object, rather than some specific coordinate in world space. That way when we move the player's parent position, the bat will move to the correct position relative to that player object. So anyways, let's go ahead and make the bat pitching position and the bat swung position. Let's just make two private variables for those. So a private vector three, we can just call it a bat pitch pause and we can make another private vector three and we can say bat swung pause. So let's go ahead and set those positions inside of start. So inside of start, what we're going to want to do is say our bat pitch pause is going to be equal to the bat's local position. So when you start up the game, whatever position the bat is currently in, it's going to stay in that position relative to the player. We can then go ahead and set our bat swung pause. So for the bat swung pause, we're going to be making it equal to a new vector three. And inside we're going to have to put an X, a Y and a Z position. Because we don't know how far away we want our bat to be, it'd be a good idea to make a serialized field at the top of our script. So just make a serialized field, private, and make a float bat swung pause offset. 
and they can be equal to one. What this variable is going to do is just move it one unit away from where we have our bat pitch position. So all we need to do is just say bat pitch pause dot x plus bat swung pause offset. We can then go ahead and just say bat pitch pause dot y and bat pitch pause dot z. So, so with those variables now assigned, let's scroll down to where we are swinging our bat. So just this little bit of logic here. And what we're going to do is just make sure we assign the bat's position to be the correct position. So for the pitching position, let's just make sure we say bat dot local position is going to be equal to the bat pitch pause. We can then do the exact same thing right in our else statement. So bat dot local position is going to be equal to bat swung pause. And with those changes made, let's save this up and let's head back into Unity. So back in Unity, we now have a bat swung pause offset and it's defaulted to one. We can just keep it as that. We might change it later on, depending on how we want it to look, but at least the value is there that we can mess around with. So let's go ahead and let's hit play. And you can tell not much has really changed, at least for the pitching position. But when we hit the left mouse button, you can see that the bat moves to a brand new position and then it just follows the cursor. We can then click yet again and it goes back to the pitching position. This looks way more in line with actually hitting a ball with a bat and I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. So the only thing left to do is to make us actually hit some sort of a ball. I think it'd be actually kind of interesting to make some sort of a mini game where there is a force meter and when we click it uses that force meter to send the ball hurling towards the crosshair. So to get started let's exit out of play mode and let's go ahead and set up that force bar now. So let's make a new UI, let's make a slider and then let's just click on our canvas and let's make it screen space camera, let's drag our camera in. And then let's just make it world space. This just solves the problem of having to scale our canvas way down. It just did the majority of that work for us. We can then go ahead and scale our canvas down yet again. And then we can click on our slider and let's just scale this up. So something like that. I'm just going to make sure that it's in the middle of our canvas. And then we can move the canvas to be somewhat on top of our player. So something like that should be fine. I'm then just going to click on the slider and we can set this up for our bar. Let's make sure that this slider is not interactable. And then because it's now disabled, let's go ahead and make that color a white color and change the alpha back to 255. We can then open up our slider and all we're gonna do is just change the visuals a little bit. Let's click on our background and instead of this background source image, let's go ahead and drag our bar into the slot. So something like that. You're going to notice it's super, super thin. So let's go ahead and let's just stretch that up. So you can kind of see where the slider was before. We should just try and match that the best we can. So something like that should be fine. I'm then going to click on our handle. And instead of this knob, let's use our little indicator that we made. Again, it's pretty small. So I'm just going to scale that up. So something like that. And I actually think it'd probably look a little bit better if we dragged it down. So it's just going to move along this bar. For our fill area, let's open that up. And I'm just going to disable the fill image. So it doesn't actually fill with anything. We can then click on our slider. And if I move this value from left to right, you can see the exact effect we're after. Now, all we have to do is change this value to be something that we want. So something like a force number. And we'll have a nice little indicator of what our force is. I'm going to just select the canvas and move it up a little bit so it's not clipping with the player. And I think that looks pretty good. So with our UI now created, let's go and head back into our picture script. So at the very, very top of our script, let's go ahead and add a using statement. So using the engine dot UI and that'll give us access to that slider. We can then go ahead and we're going to need a couple of variables. We're going to need a variable for the max force for our ball. And we're also going to need a variable to keep track of what that ball force is. So let's go ahead and let's make a new serialized field right above our bat direction. So serialized field and it's going to be a private int and we can just call this max ball force. We can then go to the very bottom of our variable declaration and make a private int ball force. 
Let's then head down below our update function and let's create a new fixed update function. So fixed update. So inside of fixed update, what we're going to do, because this is a fixed time step, is we're going to be determining what our ball force is. I'm going to want this number to bounce between zero and whatever our max force number is. And off the top of my head, the quickest way I know how to do that is by using mathf.sign. So let's go ahead and let's assign our ball force. So the ball force is going to be equal to mathf.sign. And inside the brackets, we're going to use time.time .time by our max ball force. You're going to notice that we have a bit of an error, and that's because it can't convert a float to an int, which our ball force is the int. So what we can do again is just say mathf dot round to int and then just encapsulate our sign logic in the brackets because mathf dot sign is actually going to be going from negative max ball force to positive max ball force what we can do to get the zero to our max instead is we can just use mathf dot abs so what we can do is just encapsulate all of our logic in yet another mathf so mathf dot abs and then just encapsulate all of our logic. I know this might be super confusing. Basically, we're just going from zero to whatever our max ball force is and then back down to zero and then back up and just doing that endlessly. Looking at it now, we probably could have used something like ping pong, but it just goes to show you that there are so many different ways to do things in game dev and that's why I love it. With that being said, we still have not made our slider variable. So let's go ahead and do that now so we can put the visual representation with our value. So let's scroll up and let's make another serialized field right below our max ball force. So serialized field, private slider, and we can just call this ball force slider. Let's scroll back down to our fixed update. And what we can do is say ball force slider dot value is going to be equal to ball force. We still have yet to assign a minimum and a maximum. So let's scroll up to our start method and let's say our ball force slider dot max value is going to be equal to our max ball force. We can then save this up and let's head back into unity. Back in Unity, let's go ahead and let's click play. So I click play and you can see that this slider is going up and down all by itself according to our ball force value. All that's really left to do is when we click and swing our bat to just spawn a ball with the appropriate force going in the appropriate direction. This is probably one of the easier things we've done in this episode. So let's exit out of play and go back into our script. So back in VS Code, let's go ahead and add our last variable. Let's add a serialized field, private game object, and this is going to be our ball prefab. We can then scroll down to where we have our input logic. And all we're going to do is just make a quick if statement. So if swung is equal to true, then we know we're going to want to spawn our ball. Let's instantiate our ball prefab at the bat's position with quaternion.identity as the rotation. We're gonna wanna add a force to this ball, so let's go ahead and make a temporary game object variable. So game object ball is gonna be equal to the ball we just instantiated. We can then say ball dot try get component, and we can look for a rigid body 2D. And then we can output the rigid body to the RB. So if we do have a rigid body component, we can say RB dot add force. We're going to go bet dir dot normalized and we're going to times it by our ball force. And that's it. We should now be able to swing for the fences when we swing our bat. Let's save this up and let's head back into Unity to make sure everything ties together. So back in Unity, let's click on the player and you can see the ball prefab slot and let's just drag our ball prefab into the slot. We can then go ahead and let's hit play and you can see everything is working as it was before. And I'm just gonna wait for our indicator to get to the green and sure enough, our ball goes flying. I'm gonna go ahead and hit it in the red just to show you what it would be like in comparison. And you can see the ball goes absolutely nowhere. 
We can then just go ahead and just continue flying these balls all over our scene. So here's the main question of the day. If I start walking around with the player, is the bat going to follow and be in the correct position? Let's exit out of play mode and let's click on our player and let's just add a component, player controller, which was created in the very first episode. I'm going to use transform movement and give him a move speed of three. We can then click on our canvas and just make it a child of our player. So the canvas will move around with him. Let's go ahead and let's hit play. So now the player will move back and forth and the bat is following. And when we swing, you can see that everything follows with the player and everything is working as you would expect. But that's all the time we have for this episode. I really hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you guys in the next one.